Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Christology. We're in Lesson 39, and we're looking at the uniqueness of the resurrection. This is a wonderful topic. We've kind of looked at the resurrection in the past. We're going to look a little bit more deeply into that in this lesson. I love this slide. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in history, providing irrefutable evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. The resurrection is very unique in many ways. And as we look at this today, my, my hope is for us to see that Jesus is the only person that ever claimed that he would do this and then actually did it. And that's important when you're looking at the uniqueness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection sets Jesus apart from any religious leader of all world religions. The resurrection demonstrates a few things. Distinction from all other leaders that no other leader has ever done this or claimed to do this. The power over death. And that's just a uh, just an unbelievable feat to say somebody is going to um, resurrect themselves or to come up. If we know, as we've looked at in the past, that it, the miraculous work of the resurrection was definitely uh, the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are involved in the resurrection, and that's just an amazing feat, of course, the power over death. And then the fulfillment of prophecy, that makes this extremely unique because Jesus said that, that this body will be torn down, it will be taken down. Um, he talks about this when referring to the temple, but then he says, but I'll raise it up again in three days. And then you see the natural and supernatural events happening simultaneously. What I mean by that is that there's a lot of natural events that were taking place in death, but then the supernatural comes into place and it starts over with Jesus' life, but it doesn't stop. You see the natural and supernatural in effect because Jesus eats with the disciples. Jesus clearly can be touched by the disciples. Jesus has the ability to speak to them and to listen to them. So he's in the flesh, but he's also in a supernatural type of resurrected body. So something is very unique that's happening here. And, and, and that's what we're kind of speaking on. And that's what we're looking at today. Now, there is a person named David Hume, lived in the 1700s, that, uh, here's a picture of him there, uh, very important person when we're talking about the events of the resurrection because we have to talk about supernatural things. We have to talk about miracles. And this was a, uh, a philosopher that spoke very strongly against these things. And so he has been credited and, and been quoted many times when we're looking at things such as naturalism and, and truly a, a skeptic mindset toward the resurrection. And they would read his writings, but he's a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, world and church historian, uh, economist and writer, best known for philosophical empiricism, um, and a, which is known as a person's knowledge of the world is based on his experiences. So it's what you experience through, um, through your senses. That's how you relate something to be uh, of, of any value. And so your knowledge is coming through those experiences. Then of course, he's a huge writer and proponent of skepticism, which was a doubt or unbelief with regard to any form of religion or anything really miraculous or supernatural. And then naturalism, uh, the ph philosophical belief that everything arises from natural profit properties and causes. So we're talking about uh, taking out the miracle side of anything. So when you take out the miracle side of the scripture, you're going to take out the miracle birth of Jesus. You're going to take out the miracle resurrection of Jesus Christ, the miraculous work there, along with, of course, all the miracles that he was doing. And David Hume gave many reasons for this. And, of course, other writers would come out of this of saying, okay, here's why we believe these things, because we believe in naturalism. We believe that, that things have a cause and effect. And so that's what he was putting out there. Now, Hume believed that the alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ needed to be examined more carefully, okay? Now, when we think about the, the resurrection needing to be um, examined more carefully, 
from his standpoint, what we're going to look at is the amount. Uh, we're going to look at the witnesses, you know, because there are several witnesses. The Bible talks about First Corinthians chapter fifteen, that there was over five hundred witnesses that saw the resurrected Jesus. But his take on this is interesting. He said the amount of witnesses to the resurrection did not confirm its occurrence, but the examination of the witnesses themselves. So what he's doing there is he's saying it doesn't matter how many people say they saw something. What is their state of being? What is their character? Are they drugged? Are they hallucinating? Are they going through something? What is happening here? Why are they seeing this? And is it something that's reputable? Are they credible sources? Those types of things. So he's going to look more not at the amount of witnesses, but the weight that each witness carries, and that really matters. The witnesses should be challenged on their biases and motivation or motivations. What he's saying there is that many people will join together and claim something that was not true. It happens all the time uh, in, in the world today, and that's why there's um, body cameras put on police officers today because people will say one thing, uh, there'll be a hundred witnesses, maybe they're biased against police officers, or maybe there's an issue going on in a certain community. And so a camera can actually catch what really happened. And in that, you have proof because everybody then becomes a witness. And now those hundred, maybe or 50 or 100 that were actually there that saw, maybe they were trying to do something to hurt whoever the, the um, maybe it was a police officer or something like that. And so it's important um, that you, uh, when we're thinking about this, are the people biased and what's their motivation? And this is what he's saying, which is understandable, clearly understandable. When we're looking at the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, why are they saying what they're saying? Uh, in other words, did other witnesses come forward with different experiences? So that's a question. Did other people come forward with these experiences? And so um, I think that's also important to look at because... Other people seem to say things about it. The Jews definitely made a comment about this, saying, hey, make sure that people know the body was stolen or whatever it might be. Or, or maybe there's other people that are just fighting against it. So whatever it might be, he's saying, okay, let's look at who these people are. Are they credible or not? And so those are some of the things that he had to say. Uh, he went on, went on to say this, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments. And so he makes these strong points that that miracles cannot make sense. They don't make sense. They cannot happen. And he tries to give the reasons for that. Now, there's responses to Hume. And C.S. Lewis actually gave a strong response to this. This is what he said. Unfortunately, we know the experience against miracles to be uniform only if we know that all reports of them are false. So you got to know something for first, that they're all false, right? And we can know all the reports, reports to be false only if we know already that miracles have never occurred. In fact, we are arguing in a circle. And so he's making the point here, how do you know all that? How can you be sure of all that? What, what, what makes you confident to say, okay, this can never happen? And before you know it, you're in a circular argument saying, well, we just don't know, right? And that's what C.S. Lewis is arguing. And that's a great point. Now, when we look at Hume's reasoning, we see this. There's a constant repeated sequence. A always causes B. In other words, B always follows A. Not B cannot follow A ever. And so there, there cannot be a, a, a not be follow A, if you understand that mind of thinking. So nothing else can follow A. So C can't and D can't and E. They can't follow A. Only B can because that's what always follows A. And this is what Hume's reasoning is. But there's, there's some holes in that argu argument. And so the laws of science, number one, the laws of science are changing. 
They are not absolute, but statistical. And this is clearly seen even in the laws today. We find this through the 20th century, that things change over time. And these laws, there can be events that happen in, in, in history or what we know of today, and nobody knows why they happen. Nobody. There's no statistics to go with it because it just it breaks all of those in half. And so what we have is if there's not absolutes in this, as much as there are statistics that we can look at. And so that kind of um, shoots some holes in Hume's reasoning. Also, Hume is dogmatic about things that he does not know for certain. A person claiming that God does not exist also claims that he knows everything about the universe or all that does exist. It's impossible. So he's claiming something that he doesn't know. So you have to be very careful about that. If you're claiming, for instance, that nothing supernatural could ever happen, well, that means that you know how all things work perfectly, and there is no break in that system. And so that's, that's very odd. Hume does not offer openness to the possibility of God's existence or not. What I'm saying in that is, is that he's not even opening the idea of, of there being an existence of, of the Lord God. It's just being dogmatic about certain things. And that's very dangerous when somebody closes off, when they're not clearly knowledgeable of all things, they're not all-knowing, but yet they make statements that almost claims they are all-knowing. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, and so you need to consider that. Now, when going back to the resurrection, Hume is missing the point that this resurrection, there's a lot of proof for it, but he's missing it on a philosophical side of things. There's so much evidence. There's so much there that speaks to it. Why would you even try to break it down philosophically? Now, let's look at the acronym for the resurrection. We see here the Acts of the Apostles, Lives Transformed, Illogical Fabrications, Verified by Witnesses, and the Empty Tomb. And we're going to run through these very quickly that I think are going to help us as we look at the uniqueness of the resurrection. Um, but... But these are just, this is a great acronym we looked at in the past that I think is very important to see in this uniqueness because nothing else has ever uh, driven so much of, of what Christianity is today other than the resurrection. Now, as we continue, an Acts of the Apostles, a total change in emphasis. Sabbath worship changed from Saturday to Sunday. The Holy Spirit filled believers starting at the day of Pentecost. We see that where the, where the believers, the 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 Holy Spirit came down upon them like tongues of fire and filled them, and they were they were actually given um, uh, abilities to do other things, and of course, speaking in different languages, things like that. The Passover became more ceremonial than literal. After all, Jesus was and is the Passover Lamb who is who takes away the sin of the world. So we see that the Acts of the Apostles, the the apostles were acting very differently after the resurrection, and that's important. Lives transformed. During the crucifixion and burial of Christ, many of the disciples deserted him for fear of their lives. Within a few weeks, the apostles were empowered and emboldened to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He is willing to die because his life had been transformed. Apostle Paul. The apostles counted all joy when they suffered for Christ because their lives had been transformed by Jesus. Also, illogical fabrications. The disciples' testimony. Could a lie transform them? Would they really be willing uh, to do anything for a lie? No. What was their motivation for that? Who would die for a lie? The reliability of the early historians of the New Testament is the most accurate, literal, and preserved collection of writings in all of history. It's reliable. Lack of contradictions in the New Testament is proof of its historicity. And that's what we see here, um, is that what Jesus Christ said came true. It's how to think of ourselves, talking about the transformed life. Uh, life and, and I kind of showed this slide before, but just the uniqueness of, of some of a person that's gone into um, almost like into the grave and come out and has is, is changed. They're a different person completely. And that's kind of talking about the life of a believer. Once Christ enters into the life of a believer, they're changed from the inside out. Um, 
Illogical fabrications don't add up. The Jews were looking for a Messiah that would save them from the Roman oppression. Yet Jesus came as a servant who was crucified. Women were the first witnesses. If the disciples wanted to create a hoax for the resurrected Jesus, why would they use women? Doesn't make any sense. The disciples had trouble believing the women's testimony that Jesus had risen from the dead. Why would they include this in the resurrection story unless it was true? Then we see the next thing verified by witnesses. The women at the tomb, the apostle Peter, uh, the disciples, more than 500 brothers at the same time. James, the brother of Jesus, verified, of course, Christ. Uh, and then Paul on the road to Damascus verified that Christ was who he says he is and that he rose from the dead. And then we see the empty tomb. And, and we've looked at some of these theories before, so I just want to mention them. Theories concerning the resurrection, throne theory, Jesus didn't really die. He passed out on the cross, they, and they buried him. A wrong tomb theory, that when the disciples went to get, get him at the tomb, they went to the wrong tomb. A hallucination, everybody hallucinated to what you, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Stolen body, the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Or the true resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Five theories about the resurrection. And you see just laid out here again. Um, number one, Jesus died, Jesus rose. Uh, that's Christianity. The next couple are Jesus died, Jesus, but Jesus didn't rise. The apostles were deceived, they hallucinated. Uh, the apostles were myth makers, they were creating a lie. The apostles were deceivers, trying to steal the body, those types of things. All that type of stuff was happening. Um, and so Jesus, uh, he died, but they tried to create all the stories. Or uh, the last one is Jesus died. Or, I'm sorry, Jesus didn't die. He swooned, and then he just came back alive after he healed up. All right? That's what you see there. Now, let's look a little bit more about the uniqueness of the resurrection. The tomb had to be empty during the preaching of the disciples, or their message would fall flat. Think about that. The message of the disciples was going to fall flat because they were preaching in the same area, around the same area, where Jesus Christ would have died, and then he um, rose from the dead. The scriptural account of the empty tomb gives no indication of inclusion, inclusion of folklore, legend, or myth. There's no thought of that, not even an iota of a thought looking at folklore, legend, or myth when we're talking about Jesus. The details of the Joseph of Joseph of Arimathea speaks of the time and the culture of the Jews. And so that's kind of important when you think about that. I, I, I think that's very important. You, you see the culture of things through Joseph of Arimathea. The empty tomb account is present in all four Gospels. The Semitic customs align with the biblical accounts of the burial and resurrection. It's extremely unlikely for the early church to make up the account of the resurrection and to present women as primary witnesses of the resurrection. We looked at that earlier. If the disciples are trying to fabricate the story of Jesus' resurrection, they don't seem like strong leaders as they hide from the people. That's interesting, too. They don't look like strong leaders as they hide from the people. And then continuing on, if the tomb was not empty, it is confusing that the disciples would stay in the same area and preach of Jesus' resurrection. The people would have known where the tomb was located. So that doesn't make any sense, right? Right? The non-believing Jews offered an explanation of the empty tomb. That means the tomb was empty. That's important, too. They tried to come up with a reason for why it, or, or what could be the the fake story of that. And, the, and they came up with a fake story that the body was stolen because they didn't know. But what do we know? This tomb was empty. And Joseph of Arimathea uh, would have been able to identify the tomb and answer any questions related to the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. So all this really matters. And so, why does it matter? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 sums it up once again. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. All right? Well, this has been Lesson 39, The Uniqueness of the Resurrection. Good to be with you today, and we'll talk to you real soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.